Hello, I'm Andy Larkin, Vice President and Director of Community Engagement of the Ameren Museum. Welcome to Our Story, an introduction to the culture and history of the Tohono O'odham with Bernard Siqueiros. Before we begin the program today, I want to acknowledge that Amrit is located in southeastern Arizona on lands where the Otham, Hopi, Ashwi, Yoeme, and Apache families lived for untold generations and whose wisdom and traditions live on today in vibrant communities. We are grateful for what all of these communities, rich in history, have to teach us. Thank you to our program sponsor, Desert Diamond Casinos, as well as our members and donors who enable Ameren to provide free online programming and fulfill Ameren's mission to foster and promote the knowledge and understanding of the Native peoples of the Americas through research, education, conservation, and community engagement. To learn how you can assist Ameren in supporting its mission and programs by becoming a member or donor, please visit Ameren.org. On April 30th, Amron and the Loft Cinema will host the free outdoor screening of the 1957 version of 310 to Yuma. Please visit Amron's Facebook page or website for more information. Then on May 14th at 8 a.m., there will be a birding walk at Amron with Tucson Audubon Society volunteer field trip leader, Jim Rohrbaugh. Please visit the event section of Amron's Facebook page or website for registration details. All right. Bernard Siqueiros is an enrolled member of the Tahana Autham Nation, recently retired as the Curator of Education at Hindak Key, which is the Tahana Autham Nation's Cultural Center and Museum. His experiences also include Cultural Center and Museum Project Administration, Counselor, Researcher, Program Coordinator, and Education Administrator in education entities on and off the Tahana Autham Nation. He is an avid photographer and has contributed immensely to the tribe's photo documentation efforts at the Himdaki. Mr. Sikaros also volunteers his leadership and expertise as a member of Ameren's Board of Directors. If you would like to ask any questions during the program today, please type your question in the Q&A chat box and we will gather those to share with our speaker after the presentation. We will also be sending a link uh, with a recording of today's program to all of our Zoom registrants later today. And with that, I would like to welcome you, Bernard. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, good day to each and every one of you. And greetings from the community of Covered Wells on the Thon Autumn Nation. Isn't technology wonderful where we can all come together uh, and share information that's vitally important to to many of us. Um, before I begin this presentation, there are many, many people that I would like to thank uh, for uh, helping me to understand our history or the autumn history and culture. Uh, I especially wanna thank our elders and the community members who shared their stories, songs, uh, information about, about how they understood or understand our history and Himadak culture. I also would like to thank the uh, Arizona State Museum uh, Office of Ethno uh, Historical Research, uh, who made it possible for tribal members to uh, read and discuss translated um, journals of the Spanish who were the first Europeans to come in contact with our ancestors. Uh, that was the first source of documented history on, for the Tahanawatu. We are a very oral tradition people. And so we learn of our history through our songs and our stories. Uh, we, like many people, have a creation story that explains our beginnings. Um, so it wasn't until um, when the Spanish arrived that we began to see our, our history documented through their eyes. So it was the goal of uh, the review of Spanish documents to read these documents, understanding that it is from the view of the Spanish and to, um, and to try to put 
art, an art and perspective on this document. So it was a very, it was a very enlightening project. But as I mentioned, we are an oral tradition people and we have our own creation story. Uh, we are told that we were created by uh, Iitai, who was created by Chiwetmake. Iitai is our creator, our teacher, our, our guide in life. This symbol that you see on the screen is a very important symbol in Aatum culture. Uh, it's called it is called Itoiki, but or, or the autumn know it as Itoiki, but many people know it as the man in the maze. The maze symbolizes our journey in life, which can also often be uh, full of twists and turns, complications, uh, happiness, all these things that are part of our life. And we're, we're all working towards the center, which is peace and serenity. The man you see in this mace represents Iitoi, our creator. And he is there with us throughout our life to guide us, to teach us, to help us through difficult times and be with us during happy times. So it's a very important symbol that, um, that we use, that we still recognize today. This mock tent that you see in the photo, in the slide, is a very important uh, mountain in autumn culture, in autumn Himda. Uh, I might add that throughout the throughout the presentation, I will be using the word autumn, which means the people, and I will be using the word Himda, which means our way of life or our culture, our beliefs, all those things that make up who we are. So, this mountain is referred to as Wau Giwar which translates to mean constricted rock. If you see it on the maps today, it'll say Babu Kivari Peak. Uh, and it's a very sacred mountain to the autumn because as we hear our creation stories, we learn that many times people will go to this mountain to summon Iitoi who resided in these mountains to come and help them in situations that they needed help in. So there's a place uh, in these mountains that we call Iitoiki, or the home of the creator. And it's a very special place and, and individuals who have the opportunity to go and to leave offerings uh, are often instructed that when they, when they go to this special place, and they enter this cave through a small opening in the rock, and they enter a cavern uh, and we'll see all of the offerings that have been brought by many people for many, many years. Uh, we're told that to leave those offerings alone, to try not to take something or not to take something that other people have left as offerings or has give, as gifts to the creator. They tell us that if someone tries to take something from that cave, that small hole that you entered to, that you came through to enter this cavern will begin to close and that you may not ever uh, be able to get out. And so we, we instruct our young people to make sure when they go to this special place to take something to offer to the creator and to leave those items that other people have left as offerings. Many people consider wild cure of this area to be uh, the center of the universe. We look at this map uh, in, in the center, a little bit toward the top is an outline of our nation today, the Tahana Atom Nation. Second largest Indian nation in the United States. The larger area outside of that map indicates our Aboriginal or ancestral lands. Uh, we refer to these lands as the lands of our stories and our songs. Uh, we learn or we know that there were three distinct groups of autumn that resided in this area. 
along the rivers, what's now called the San Pedro, the, the Santa Cruz, the Sonoran, the Gila River, the Salt River, all these areas where autumn lived, were, these autumn were referred to as Akamod autumn, or in some cases referred to as Sobipri autumn. These autumn, because they, were, they had a source of water, were primarily farmers. They irrigated the land around the rivers and grew many of their crops uh, for, to sustain their, their livelihood. But they also were hunters and gatherers. The autumn in the center part of this map in the desert were referred to as Tohono autumn or desert people or people of the desert. These people were a semi nomadic group. They migrated from winter village to summer village. Their winter village was often found in the mountains and the foothills where water could be found. Uh, during the summer, they would migrate to the, low, the lowlands in areas where water would flow from the monsoons. They would work the grounds there and, and divert monsoon waters to their fields to irrigate their crops and, and, and grow their food. Once crops were, were um, harvested uh, and stored, they would move back to their winter village for, the, for, for water. So these people, these Tohono Autumn, were a semi-nomadic group moving from winter village to summer village, as opposed to the Akamar Autumn, who lived in stable communities along the rivers because they had water, or they had a source of water. Then we had a third group of Autumn that lived to the far west of our, our area. Now these Autumn were referred to as Hiachit Autumn, because they came from an area that was somewhat sandy along the, along the beaches there, the coast, you have large sand dunes, which is made out of very fine sand. And so these autumn here were the hunters and gatherers in this area. And so they were referred to as Hiachit autumn. So we have Hiachit autumn, we have Tohono autumn, we have Akamad autumn, but they were all of one people. They were referred to as Akamar Autumn, Tohono Autumn, Hiachit Autumn because of where they lived. And, uh, and so when the Spanish arrived in this part of the world and came in contact with our ancestors, we note that uh, this whole area was where uh, our ancestors resided. As I mentioned, we refer to this area as the land of our of our stories and our songs. There are many stories that talk about places throughout this entire area. There are many songs that sing about places throughout this entire area. So we know that this land was our Aboriginal or ancestral homelands. Spanish came, things began to change. Uh, Christianity was introduced. Uh, our way of life was somewhat frowned upon by the new people and, uh, and attempts were made to change our way of life. Uh, in, the, in 1853, uh, after the Mexican-American War was settled, uh, land was purchased from Mexico to create a buffer zone for a international railroad that would run from uh, Texas to California. And so it was called the Gaston Purchase. When the Gaston Purchase was made, it created the bounded, the line that you see that runs diagonal across our lands, our homelands. When that decision was made uh, to buy land for this railroad, our forefathers were not consulted with <laughs> to determine how this purchase would affect our way of life. And so when that, land, when, when that line was created, it was marked by the markers that you see in, in the picture at the bottom left. Uh, those markers went in all along that line uh, to indicate that there was an international boundary that had been created between the United States and Mexico. 
our forefathers uh, paid no attention to those markers whatsoever because they saw the land on both sides of those markers uh, as autumn land, as our homeland. You know, there were communities on the other side of those uh, markers where relatives lived. There were areas on either side of those markers where people went to uh, gather foods from the desert or to hunt or to, to just maintain the style of living that, that they had all along, that they always had. And so uh, it wasn't until much later when a fence was finally put on that line. And then now we see um, uh, a little more secure fencing along that line because of uh, concerns that people have about illegal immigrants or migrants coming in who are not uh, American citizens. I might add that uh, when, when that line was created, many of the communities that ended up in Mexico, a lot of our members moved back up north into the, into the United States uh, for employment and for education purposes. Uh, our total enrollment for the Tahan Autumn Nation is approximately 35,000 members. Uh, in the United States, about 60% of our members reside outside of our nation. They reside in communities uh, in throughout Arizona and throughout the country, in fact. And we still have about 200, or I'm sorry, 2,000 enrolled members that live in community, autumn communities in Mexico. So out of that 35,000 membership, we have not only those members that live within the boundaries of the nation, we have members that live outside the nation, and we have members that live down in Mexico, which would be an entirely different country. I mentioned earlier that uh, there are many songs and stories about the lands of our ancestors. This is just, this mountain here is just an example of one a uh, very significant mountain in, in our, in our Himadak. Uh, it's called the Superstition Mountains, or we call it Ka'akorek. Uh, in, in our creation story, as in many creation stories, there's a major flood that took place in the early time. And this flood, as the water began to rise, the people looked or went to high ground, to areas to to save themselves from the rising waters. And so people gathered on top of this mountain. Uh, along with them came that many of the animals that were, that were around. And so the story tells us that, that as the people gathered on top of this mountain, um, and the dog that was with the group, or a dog that was with the group, went to the edge of the cliff and looked down and saw the water continue to rise. And so when he came back to the people to tell them, he spoke to the people and told them the water is rising. And when he spoke to the people, the people turned to stone. And so if we look at areas like, it's hard to see in this picture because it's kind of, it was a real hazy day, but you see on top of this mountain right here, uh, uh, rocks that look like people up on top of that mountain. And so it's a, this is just an example of one of the many mountainous mountain areas on our lands that have songs and stories about them. There are songs about this mountain that uh, people sing to remember and to recognize its significance in our hymn book. Our ancestors um, were very, connected to the earth. They were con very connected to the environment. And so they learned through time that they could take things from the desert to make the things or, or, or get the things that they needed to survive. I was speaking with an elder one time at a meeting that we had, and we were discussing uh, foods, in fact. And this elder, highly respected elder by the name of Felix Anton, who 
said, you know, when I look out into the desert or look out onto our land, I see our grocery store because anything he ever needed to eat, he could find in the desert. Then he said, when I look out into the desert, I see my, my uh, hardware store, which is true because the, the desert provided all of the materials that we needed to build our homes, uh, Ramada, some other things that we needed. And then he says, when I look out into the desert, I see my drug store, which is true as well, because there are many, many plants out there, many plants that provide uh, medicines for various ailments. And so there are people that know of these uh, medicines, plants, and use them to help, help people. And so it's true, the, 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 the women would take clays and sands and other things from the desert to make a mixture of, of uh, clay so they could make the, the pots that we see in the picture. And these pots were used to, to, for, for water, to, to preserve seeds, to cook in, uh, to just everyday utilitarian uses. And so uh, this, this way of doing things began to fade a little bit uh, but with the help of young women, such as the lady you see in the, in the picture, she uh, helped to revive, her and others have helped to revive this, this skill or this art or this ability to take soil from the earth, make these beautiful pots for use every day. We would also go out into the desert to harvest certain plants or to collect certain plant materials that were used to create baskets. Um, the autumn are, are well known for, for their baskets and their pottery. But baskets originally, again, were made for everyday utilitarian purposes. Uh, the elder woman you see sitting inside her basket is creating a large basket that will be used to store grain, uh, corn, or whatever. What, once the harvest is in from their fields, this is what they'll use. They'll often take that, that large basket and set it on top of the ramada that you see behind her. And they do this to keep the rodents away because the rodents are, rodents are also very hungry. And so they would, would want to find their way to get into these Basket. So anything you can do to preserve your seed, your food, uh, is done. Uh, the woman with a large basket on her back, she's carrying a, what, what, what we call a kiho, filled with wood for, for heating the home or for cooking or for other things. And so baskets, again, were made for everyday use uh, by our, our, our ancestors. The young women in the picture uh, at the left bottom are young ladies who are learning to make baskets today. But baskets today are made for bringing income into the household. They're not so much made for utilitarian uses anymore, but often baskets are, 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 uh, are things that people purchase. And the, the purchase of baskets provides income to uh, many in the families on the nation. A little bit about our foods. You know, the saguaro that you see in this picture uh, grows only, or the saguaros grow only in autumn lands. We call them ha shan. And we harvest the fruit of the saguaro um, for food, and for ceremonial purposes. The saguaro is, is, is a prominent site on our lands. And in fact, the, in our creation story, there is a story that makes reference to the first saguaro that emerged from the ground where a young person that sank into the ground. Uh, and so it's a very important plant as all plants are. But you can see the artist's rendition of the harvesting of the fruit of the saguaro, which is usually done in, in late June and July. 
And at the bottom, you can see the fruit of the saguaro that, that with the seeds and the pulp, it's a very sweet, sweet uh, fruit. And we take that, the pulp of the fruit and we boil it, we, we boil it and boil it and, and until, and then we, we, we sift it and remove the seeds and then we boil the juice to the consistency of syrup. And so that's where we get our syrup. Uh, some of that syrup will be taken and, and the, the seeds that were removed will be, will be ground up and added to the syrup to create a jam. So we make syrups and we make jams from the fruit of the sawaram. Some of that syrup will be donated to an individual who will take donations from many families and take this syrup and mix it all together and inside our, our roundhouse, the ceremonial roundhouse, and prepare it for uh, our rain ceremony. So once this, this mixture of, of syrup is fermented, they will remove that from the roundhouse and people will come and they will partake of this drink and sing and sing for rain and pray for rain. So it's a very important uh, uh, fruit in our Himadak. Another uh, very healthful or food is what we call chardim or the prickly pear. Uh, the prickly pear uh, fruit is, is very, a very healthy source, uh, source of food, of nutrition. Uh, but it is a very thorn, <laughs> thorny bud that we see. And so uh, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to not only collect the chardim, but to clean them so that uh, all of the thorns that you see on them are removed. Uh, and this, the buds themselves can be boiled and eaten once they've become soft, or they can be boiled and then placed out in the sun to dehydrate. Uh, so that you can preserve them. And throughout the year, you can take what you want to eat, throw them in a, in a pot of boiling water, and they'll rehydrate, and they're just as good as the first day you boil them. And so it's a good source of a very nutritious food that will last you throughout the year. And so this food is, 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 has proven to reduce the sugar in a person's system if they eat it on a consistent basis. Other foods that we find, uh, these are just examples of the many, many foods that Mr. Anton referred to. Uh, the, the grocery store in the desert, the uh, aot or the, uh, the agave plant that we see provides a sweet um, food. The prickly pear are also very uh, a sweet source of fruit. The, the mesquite beans, which we refer to as weehawk, uh, also are, are beginning to, to, to come out right now this time of year. Uh, and so these foods were, were collected and, and eaten, processed, uh, for many, many years, from the beginning of time, these were foods, examples of foods that were provided by nature. As we learned to farm, we grew beans, we grew corn, we grew squash, we grew melons, we grew other kinds of foods that were, that were taught to us by our creator. So there was another source of food that we could cultivate. And so we began to cultivate foods as well as collecting foods from the desert that was provided by nature. And this is how we sustained ourselves. This is how we, uh, we provided food for our families and this is how we survived. When the Europeans came into our land, they introduced new types of, of foods that we adopted. Uh, the, fig, the figs that we see, the suna we call them, the caranaya or the pomegranate, plants that were brought by the Spanish, they became a part of our gardens. Many of them planted these types of trees in their gardens to provide 
fruits that were were typically not traditional, but were a very good source of food. And so we we adopted many of the things that the Spanish brought to us in the form of food and other things. We hunted uh, animals in the desert for meat. We hunted chui or rabbits. We hunted huau or big um, mule deer. We hunted chushan, uh, mountain goats or um, bighorn sheep. We hunted tashikor or the javelina that we see. These are just examples again of the source of meats that were provided for us. We had an elder, we were, we, were, we were speaking with an elder one time and the elder says, you know, when we were kids, we rarely ate meat. We always ate what we collected from the desert or what we grew in our gardens or our fields. So he said, the only time we ate meat was when a hunter would go out and he would be successful and he would bring back the meat and he would share with the entire village because this is what we did. We were sharing people. And so uh, she says, but today our young people, they want to eat meat every day. In the morning, they want breakfast or ham or, or bacon or, or for breakfast, they want bacon or ham with their eggs and things. At noon, they want a hamburger or a hot dog or whatever. In the evening, they want a steak or a hamburger. Or so it's like our, our young people today feel like they have to eat meat every day. And yet that wasn't the way it was. The only time we ate meat was when a hunter was successful and shared the, their, their meat. Our games kept us very slim. Our games required a lot of running for both men and women. Um, long distance runners were held in very high esteem. Um, long distance runners were a source of our ability to communicate with other communities throughout this vast desert lands. Uh, leaders in communities often had someone nearby that they would call on and they often called this individual their kahyo or their leg. They would call their leg their, their, their runner and they would ask them or instruct them to run to a far village to share whatever information needed to be shared and to bring back information that they had for this leader or the community. So in this way, this is one of the ways we communicated with one another was through runners. Oftentimes when, when our enemies would come into our lands, runners would go throughout the lands to instruct the people to prepare themselves, to protect themselves, to prepare to protect themselves from the enemies that were coming into our land. So running was extremely important. So we have many games that had that required running and we supported these, these runners. The women also ran, uh, as we can see in this photograph, we have a, a photograph of women running what we call a ha'a race. The ha'a is that, that, that oya on top of their heads and they balance them as they run along. And the kind of the faded picture at the bottom shows a group of women who just finished their, their ha'a race. And so all of these races were, were, were supported by, by their, their family and friends. And, and often many of these races, um, bets were placed on how, on the outcome of, of the races. There was a, a publication or a book was published by a uh, man by the name of McCarthy. It's called The Papago Traveler. And in, in, in a chapter in his book, he talks about a time when he was young and they traveled to the center part of our lands and there was a gathering of people. And all they were, they were, they were there together for a day of, of games, a day of races, a, game, a day of when people came together from all over to compete against one another. And the night before the races were to take place, there were campfires all in the area and, and there were men go, going back throughout all these camping areas, making bets on the following day's uh, 
uh, outcome. And so by the end of the following day, he says that some people left with extra horses or extra wagons or, or, or things that they had won. And some people left with nothing because they had lost um, uh, on the bets that they had placed. So we were wagering people and we supported one another or supported our runners through these, through these activities. Our women, they still play this game we call toka. It's a women's game. And men don't play this game. And so we can see the picture at the top of, of uh, the grandmothers or the great grandmothers of the women down below who are continuing to play this game. An elder that we, we interviewed at one time regarding this game said, um, Toka is not just a game. Toka is our way of life. So Timada, she said, is how we it's is part of our way of life. So we can understand how important these games are to us. And again, there were they were they were bets that were made on many of these games that that uh, were played. Today's autumn. Uh, we still celebrate uh, traditionally when we can. Up top. Uh, the black and white photo, you see a community uh, social gathering, people coming together to celebrate, to, to be with each other, to, to celebrate whatever it is they're celebrating. Down below is a picture of autumn at Himdaki, the nation's culture center museum. And they're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the opening of this museum. And anytime people came together, uh, we would celebrate in this way. At the museum, I know that when we, when we would have these gatherings, we would always instruct uh, our visitors who were non-autumn that we do these things uh, not as a, not as entertainment. We do these things not uh, as, yeah, not as entertainment, but we do these things to share the culture. We do these things to celebrate and we want people to celebrate with us. And so it's a very important way of bringing people together in a social gathering. Today, many changes have been made in our nation. Uh, we chartered, uh, community college uh, in um, 20, 20 years ago, which has grown uh, and provides uh, higher education services to our young people who come through Don Autumn Community College and then move on to major universities throughout the country. We more recently uh, took over uh, the health programs on the nation. We now, as a nation, operate three health clinics and a hospital, which were normally operated by Indian Health Services. And so we also, uh, many years ago, or a few years ago, uh, constructed a, um, a skilled nursing facility for our elders. Uh, prior to this, many of our elders, uh, when they needed uh, constant care, were often sent off to contracted, uh, in contracted uh, nursing facilities outside of our nation, which made it difficult for their families to visit them. And the elders often said that they missed uh, not being able to speak to someone in our language and that they missed the foods that we were uh, used to at home. And so that was part of the driving force in building this facility so that we could bring those elders home could bring those elders home so their families could visit them and, uh, and they would be able to speak to members of their families in, in the language. Education has always been an important part of our Himdak. Uh, we know uh, education uh, throughout our area. We have in this picture uh, middle school students 
being promoted to high school. We have high school students who are about ready to receive their diplomas. And then we have at the bottom uh, students from the Tahanautam Community College who have just received their, their degrees or certificates from the college. And so many of these students uh, have gone back into the workforce or, and some of them have moved on to colleges and universities uh, throughout the country. And so we, we continue to support education. Uh, our kids are kids like anywhere else. They, they enjoy life, they enjoy having fun, they, they go to school, they, uh, they, they play outdoors. Uh, right now, many of them are very computer savvy, uh, much more than I am, I think. But they're, they're kids, like anywhere else. And we, we nurture them, uh, we do what we can to help them understand who they are as people, uh, who, are, who they are as all of them. Um, we continue to, to reinforce this idea that the students should never forget where they came from, that they're, that they're a member of a great nation. And so we're very heartened by young people who participate in many of the ceremonial activities because this shows us that, that our way of life will continue as it has throughout the, throughout, throughout the years. There have been some changes, but again, some of those core things that make us who we are have, have continued to, to be there. And, and, and so when we see young people uh, who participate in, in these ceremonies, it's, 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 it's good, it's very encouraging to know that our, our hymn that will continue through these young people. And then in the 1930s, there was an anthropologist who lived among uh, the Aatam. Her name was Ruth Underhill. Dr. Underhill uh, wrote several books on Aatam. And there was one book entitled, The People of the Crimson Evening. And certainly that's who we are. And we see that every, not every evening, but most evenings from as the sun goes down, uh, the skies turn red, and it's a beautiful sunset. And so this is how I'm going to end this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will answer any questions that may be asked. Thank you so much, Bernard. And what lovely photos you've included in your presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming um, most of those are yours, if not all. Most, most of these photographs are, yes, are my photos. They're lovely. Um, our first question is, are the Atham the descendants of the Hohokam? Uh, yes. Um, it, may, it made real sense to me one time. I mean, the term Hohokam means, uh, or Hohokam. Hohokam is is a term meaning those people that have gone. And there was an elder one time who was talking about, about his, uh, his great, great grandfather or his great grandfather and, then, and, and the people of that generation. And he says, uh, which means those people are already, are, they've all gone, which means they've all, they've all moved on, they've all passed away. And so the Huhukam or Huhukam or Huhukam are our are, are ancestors that are no longer with us. Some people think it means that there, there are people that are no longer, that are, have disappeared. There are whole different people that have disappeared, but they're no longer with us because nobody lives forever. But we, we are the descendants of the Huhukam. A long way to answer that that question, but yes, we are descendants of the Huhuka. And regarding the events that you mentioned, are there events that are open to the public? Uh, well, yes, I mean, by invitation, I think. I know that there are activities that are planned uh, for the general public uh that are open to anyone but there are um certain ceremonies that 
uh, probably, I mean, are, are, are not like public events. They're, I mean, they're public for all of them, but I, but I, I know that some of them will bring uh, friends who are non-tribal members to some of these events. So, um, yeah, there's there's some that are open to all communities, uh, and but a lot of those are usually held well, like at the museum. You know, when we have when we have gatherings, there are there are there are oftentimes many non autumn that will will come and and participate. You mentioned long distance runners getting and sharing information about enemies. Mm -hmm. Who are the enemies? <laughs> uh, I mentioned in that land that we were that we that we consider our ancestral lands. There were other indigenous people that lived. Uh, around us, and, and you mentioned some in, in your introduction earlier, some of the tribes that lived along the San Pedro River, but there were many, many people that would come there, people that would come and, and raid our, our communities, um, and raid our, our steal our food, in many cases, steal our children, our women, and uh, these primarily were the Apaches that would come and, and, and do this, and, and so those were our, our primary, what we considered our primary enemies. In fact, in, in our language, the term for the Apache is alt, which means the enemy. Uh, thank goodness it's no longer that way today, but uh, in earlier times, this, this is how we could consider this group of people. And I have a Toka question. Okay. Uh, Regarding the sticks that the, mm -hmm. the what exactly do they do with the sticks? Uh, okay, so the stick is made out of mesquite, a mesquite branch that was heated and straightened and, and kind of bent at the end. So it, it looks somewhat like a hockey stick. And so uh, the 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 Ora, which is what they used to 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 like a like a hockey puck, I guess. The ora is two two carved pieces of mesquite tied with a, a leather thong. And so the stick is used to push that thong or that, that piece, that game piece, to a set goal. It can either push it along the ground like you would push a hockey puck along the ice or that, that order and toss it toward the goal. Now, when women came together to play thaka, uh, there would be a predetermined goal set. Uh, in many cases, the goal was quite a distance, distances apart. And so the women would come together facing one another in a line and they would sing to their sticks before they started. And once that order was dropped in the center, much like hockey, once that order was dropped in the center, the game began. And the, the order was not picked up by the hand. It was so you use the stick to move it to your goal. And once you got it past your goal, then you could pick it up. And that's when you scored a point. And then they would come back to the center and start all over again. And so this is how that game was played. And I've had a, a few questions regarding music. Okay. Uh, would you be able to touch on the music a little? And one of the specific questions is, uh, how was Wyla incorporated into your culture? Uh, okay. Uh, well, we, we have like, traditional, real traditional um, songs that are sung even today. Uh, and these songs, um, again, tell stories, uh, identify special areas. Um, they, they, in fact, I was told that songs, when, 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 these, when these singers come together, they can often take you on a tour of our lands through their songs. They will bring you bring you back home and sing about the songs that that ident that they identified with as home, and so there are those kinds of songs. When uh, 
when the Europeans entered our lands, of course, there they were, they were, they were many things that they brought that were different, were, 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 um, that we, we either neglected or rejected or we, we adopted. Uh, we're told um, that, that musicians, the, 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 these Europeans also brought their music. And the music, we, we began to learn to play their instruments. Uh, there were many Europeans that played uh, polka music. And so when we, when we began to learn to play their instruments and their polka type music, we, we adapted, it, adapted that type of music to what we call chicken scratch today or wireda music. It's often referred to as chicken scratch uh, because uh, when you dance, it's a two-step kind of polka type of dance. You're kind of sliding along the ground and you're, and you're making a, a chicken-like sound on the ground as, 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 your, as your feet shuffle on the ground. And so that's the term chicken scratch, but we call it wireda music. And of course, wireda is just uh, the Spanish word for dance. And so it's, it's um, yeah, so that's how we adapted or adopted and adapted uh, Spanish music or European music. And I also have a few questions uh, coming from Kim um, The first uh, is, do you know if it's open? And also, if you would just share a little bit more about the museum and cultural center. Sure. Uh, him. Okay. First of all, it's uh, it's called Himdaki House of Culture, Hukyu Homo in Biha, which means House of Culture, Past, Present, and Into the Future. And it opened its doors in two thousand and seven. It, uh, it has a very large repository for the story of artifacts and other things uh, related to our history. We have uh, uh, archives for documented history uh, in our library. And then we have our exhibit hall, which um, has some very nice exhibits on, on, on all of them. And then we have, as a separate building, we have a cultural center where uh, People gather in, in the center. We have an elders room, which was created for, uh, as a place where elders could come and rest uh, during the times there are gatherings and people are outside dancing and eating and other things. And so it's a very special place. Um, when, when, when I was there, uh, this was of course before the pandemic, uh, we had visitors from all over the world that would come and visit. Uh, people that were in southern Arizona would somehow find their way to Himdaki. Uh, the University of Arizona provided many visitors from South and Central American countries to visit uh, the museum or to, to learn about autumn history and culture. Uh, we've had vi European visitors from many countries in, in Asia and Europe. And it was just amazing, an amazing place. Uh, but with the pandemic, uh, the doors were shut, uh, I think, around March or April of 2000, and, of 2000 and, uh, or 20, let's see, yeah, 20,000, I guess, and, and have not, I don't believe they're open yet. I think they're still uh, waiting uh, to open to the public, but as of, as of now, uh, uh, it's not open to the public because of that. And is the Atham language taught in schools by or by elders in gatherings? Uh, recently, the Tohon Atham Nation has recognized the fact that our language is endangered. Uh, we still have fluent speakers. We have people that are maybe not as fluent, but understand the language. Uh, we have people who understand very little and don't speak. And we have people who don't speak at all. And when we look at the demographics or the, the 
we see that the, the fluent speakers and the people that understand and speak some are people that are uh, either elder or, or older adults. And, and, the, and the people that don't understand or understand a little but don't speak or understand not at all are younger, are younger people. And so with that understanding, the nation uh, approved a resolution to establish uh, an autumn language center, which would, uh, which would um, help to revitalize the language uh, by teaching it uh, and helping people because there have been attempts by many people to, to teach the language. And so one of the, one of the goals of this center is to bring all of these people together, all the materials that have been developed, all the, and, and bring it together. So there's one uh, clearinghouse for this material, but to also develop uh, immersion programs and other kinds of programs that will help uh, promote the language, promote and teach the language throughout our land. So, so there, there is that hope that, um, that this will uh, maintain our language so that it will continue for generations to become to to come. So, yeah, it is it is a real concern of 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 our of our leaders of our elders. Uh, but I'm glad to see that we are doing something about that because there are many there are many indigenous groups that have totally lost their language or on or 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 are on the verge of losing their language where we where we see that we, we don't want to head in that direction. We want to, we want to be able to, to address it now before we get to that point where we, where we, where we lose the language. So yeah, work's been, do, been done on it now, or work's been being uh, worked on right now, or the language's been worked on. Bernard, thank you so much for an outstanding presentation today. We have so many questions. We could probably keep going for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But again, thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank you. And, and thank, thank everyone you. for for um, for for coming on board. I guess it was interesting. <laughs> yes, and thank you to uh, our audience for joining us. There's also been questions. Is this being recorded? Will we send out a video? And indeed, we will. Uh, that should be sent out later today for all of our Zoom registrants. Again, thank you to our audience and a special thanks to you, Bernard. Have thank a good you. Day, everyone. Mm -hmm.